I like the sentiments of the closing words of that last song and stand entire at last. John had some things to say in 1 John and chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because him knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This morning I started with the concept of God in Islam and Christianity. And we pointed out several things about the Quran's teaching concerning Allah. But we also spend a great deal of time what the Bible teaches concerning God, the one divine essence composed of three persons. And I said several times that God is love. I'm quite sure, if nothing else, out of experience for many years, that a host of folks talk about the love of God and the love uh, we're to have as brothers and sisters in the church is not understood. And we need to know, if we're to know about God as God is, all we can from his revealed word concerning the very essence of God and the one divine nature that flows from that essence and how there is no God but the God who reveals himself in the Bible. Now I was talking this morning about God being love and I want to read something now from the pen of John. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. There's a reason for that and he tells us, for love is of God. That tells me the source of love is God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. I have to understand what that love is and what it is not. Verse 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. I mentioned this morning that God is love, as the scripture says, <clears throat> but who did he love? He said, well, he loved man, John so declares here. But he was loved before there was man. Man's a created being. Who did he love before there was man? Who did he love before there were the angels? You may just think that, well, there's always been angels. They're not eternal. They're special created beings to serve in heaven. Man made a little lower than the angels is a special created being for things we don't even know what lies ahead of us. For those of us who die in the faith and go to heaven and see him as he is, and as the song says, we'll be made whole on that day. I wish I understood what that means as it's derived from the totality of the scriptures concerning what it'd be like to be glorified in a resurrected body fitted for eternity in the walk in the very presence of God, which is to walk in the presence of love. So God loved himself. Thus you have a triune being, one single, solitary, divine, eternal essence, composed of three persons. We're just one person. We can, it's hard to understand one, one divine essence. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. 
but composed of three persons. Inseparable. You say, well, how did Christ come to earth if he's inseparable? Well, just because he tabernacled in the body of a man like we have, became man, doesn't mean he was totally separated from the divine essence. It means his powers were limited. I know that if I don't know anything else other than the fact that when it came to the end of the world, he says nobody knows of the Father. So it's obvious he limited himself. But he also prayed, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. And that happened when he went back to heaven. Well, I assure you, he knows when he's coming back. But not when he was on the earth, walking like you walk and I walk, feeling as we feel and I feel. But now he's back at the right hand of God ruling. And the ruler knows what he's going to do. Because he's as much God as God is God because he is God. And God is love. So we emphasize that this morning because you don't have that in Allah concerning the nature of God and the one person that they claim is God. So now I want to move to our second point in our study, and hopefully we can get through it in reasonable time, that Islam has a morally deficient concept of God, a morally deficient concept of deity. We've seen that Muslims and Christians, and I'm using Muslim as the Quran would define a Muslim and Christian as the New Testament would define a Christian, that they agree that God by definition is the greatest conceivable being and that besides being all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, and so forth, the greatest conceivable being must, it's imperative, must also be morally perfect. And that means that God must be a loving and gracious being. And that's where the Bible presents him. Therefore, God, as the perfect being, must be all loving. And again, I say that's exactly what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, and I just read it to you, God is love. In this love... Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the sacrifice for our sins. 1 John 4, verses 8 and 10. Or again, it makes it clear through the writing of the inspired Apostle Paul that God shows His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. Jesus taught God's unconditional love for sinners. And that's a very important point. We see this in his parables about the prodigal son. We see it in the lost sheep parable. In his practice of his association with the immoral and unclean people, but not participating in their sins. Remember, he said, the whole he not a physician. And he was condemned by the Pharisees for going to feasts where there were people that they wouldn't associate with at all. And I think that ties in for those who heard it with what Brother Jeff Lipsky said a while back, uh, I think last Sunday morning in class, when he said all association is not fellowship. And that's exactly right. Because you can have the rankest of sinners in this assembly. And simply because they're here and some of the best people on earth as Christians are here with them does not mean we're in fellowship with them. And in fact, I wish that every gap in these pews was filled with some ranked sinners. Because I want them to hear the gospel. I want them to know the power of God and the salvation. So Jesus did too. He didn't participate in their sins. He didn't fellowship in their sins. But you have to make yourself available to, to somebody to teach them. Unless you figure out a way you can teach sinners without teaching sinners. You look at the Sermon on the Mount. And you see that love. Notice Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Think of his audience. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. 
Now why do that? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Now remember, this is the God of love who sends the rain on the just and the unjust also. Who keeps allowing time to go on that all men should come to repentance and be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. And that's when he said, For he maketh the Son, his Son, to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth the rain on the just and on the unjust. Now watch this. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? I step aside just for a moment and point out those folks who believe you can only help saints, members of the church, out of the treasury seemingly forgot. Verse 46. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Well, Christians must be expected to do more than others. Others who? Others of this world who are living on the level of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Yes, Christians are different. Not different for the sake of being just different, but different because they love God and keep His commandments. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publican so. Now watch what he says in concluding this. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Did Jesus tell us to do something we can't do? So he can stand at the judgment and say, I knew you couldn't do it anyway. I just want to see you wear yourself to death all your life knowing you couldn't be what I told you you had to be so I could stand here and glare at you at the judgment and say I'm so happy to send you into perdition. Well, that just grates against the scriptural nerve, doesn't it? Grates against all the truth of the Bible concerning God is love. The love of the Heavenly Father is impartial. It's universal. And it's unconditional. I think sometimes the church forgets that as the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular as we are to go out and teach the saving truth of the gospel to other people who are dirtied in sin. It bothers me that sometimes we expect people to live as the New Testament teaches Christians are to live before they ever become Christian. Before they ever know any better. We need to think about that when we try to go out and work with people because I know how God works in this world. And he sends the rain on the just and the unjust also. Without condoning or fellowshipping anything that makes a person a sinner or unjust. Surely, members of his spiritual body can do the same thing. Now, I want to point out some things that are something you will never hear from the media of our country or from most of our public officials. There's a simple reason for that. They're afraid to say it. They're afraid of risking the alienation of hundreds of millions of Muslims by saying anything critical of Islam. No matter how true it is about Muslims. It's simply this. The God of the Quran is not the loving God revealed by Jesus and we've been reading about from the Bible. According to the Quran, God does not love sinners. Is that just an empty charge from a Christian? Because I don't like Muslims, I don't like the Quran, I don't like Islam. No, it's not. This fact is emphasized repeatedly and consistently on the pages of the Quran. All you have to do is just listen to the passages or from a Quran available to you, read them. God loves not the unbelievers. Surah 3, verse 33. God loves not the impious and sinners. 2, verse 277. God loves not evildoers. 3 in verse 58. God loves not the proud. 4 in verse 37. 
God loves not transgressors. 5 and verse 88. God loves not the prodigal. 6 and verse 142. God loves not the treacherous. 8 and verse 59. God is an enemy to unbelievers, too, in verse 99. Again and again and again, the Quran declares that God does not love the very people whom the Bible says God loves and has made a way for their forgiveness. That the greatest of the great was given to make that forgiveness possible because God is love. So he loved them so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for them, John 3 and verse 16. No hesitancy on the second person of the Godhead, the eternal word becoming man in order to accomplish the salvation of man. Now, the foregoing may seem paradoxical in view of the fact that the Quran calls Allah, Ar-Raham Ar-Rahim, the all-merciful, until you realize that according to the Quran, what God's mercy really cashes out and comes into and is rendered to be this, that if you believe and do righteous deeds, then guess what? God can be counted on to give you what you have earned, plus a bonus. Thus, you have this in the Quran. Work and God will surely see your work. 9 and verse 105. Every soul shall be paid in full for what it has earned. 2 and verse 282. Those who believe and do deeds of righteousness and perform the prayer and pay the alms, their wage awaits them with the Lord. 2 verse uh, 278. According to the Quran, God's love is thus reserved only for those who earn it. In other words, he doesn't love the whole world like the Bible says the God of the Bible loved the whole world. Well, when he loved the world, what state was the world in? The Bible makes it very clear. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. To those who believe and do righteousness, God will assign love. 19 verse 97. That's all from the Quran. Thus the Quran assures us of God's love for the God-fearing and the good doers, but he has no love whatsoever for sinners and unbelievers. None. If the church, the spiritual body of Christ, that became that through people believing the gospel and obeying it, does not exhibit the love of God to those in sin, What do ye more than others? Sometimes wonder if our own brethren understand what I just said. Or maybe there's possibly a little bit of Islam in us all. So, in the Islamic conception, God is not all loving. His love is partial and it has to be earned. The Muslim God only loves those who first love him. His love thus rises no higher than the love which Jesus said even tax collectors and unbelievers exhibit. But the Bible says the Christian's love must be greater than that. The Quran's teaching about Allah is an inadequate and erroneous conception of God. Is it not? What would you think? Now I want you to think closely with me here in this day of the broken home and handicapped children. What would you think of a parent And you must draw from what you already know the Bible says parents are to be. What would you think of a parent who said to his children, if you measure up to my standards and do as I say, then I'll love you. Now there are some who have had parents like that. In other words, they they didn't love you unconditionally. And any such person bears psychological and emotional scars as a result of it. God never intended that when you see all he teaches about the responsibility and the love and kindness and tenderness and training and teaching that parents are to give the children. 
as the greatest conceivable being, the most perfect being, the source of all goodness and love, God's love must be unconditional and thus impartial. Therefore, the Islamic conception of God is morally deficient, just plain wrong, and thus unacceptable. Therefore, it must be opposed in what the Bible teaches about God advocated and defended because what the Bible teaches is the truth. Thus, the, un the understanding that the Quran teaches about God is rationally, Unacceptable, but what the Bible teaches is acceptable because it fits the way we are because we're made in the image of God morally. And that's where your sense of oughtness comes from. It's amazing what can work on us to cause us to see things not as they are, but through the tinted glasses that our upbringing has put on us. Undoubtedly, the difference between Jesus as Heavenly Father and the God of Muhammad is most clearly exhibited in the attitude that we're commanded to have as the Lord's church toward non-believers or as Islam had towards unbelievers. Jesus said that we should love unbelievers. On what basis? That's how you're like God. One of the ways you're like God, just as God loves them. Well, even if they are our enemies... Muhammad's attitude and teaching are to the contrary. Early in Muhammad's career, when he himself was persecuted because of being in the minority, it's interesting to note that he had a very positive attitude toward Jews and Christians, and that's when he called them people of the book because of their adherence to the Bible. He believed that once the Jews understood his message, then they would willingly convert to Islam. Passages in the Quran from this early period of Muhammad's life are quite positive toward Jews and Christians. And this is where you see even Muslims giving you feedback from this period of his life. But that was only one period of his life, and since he wasn't inspired of God, he reflects the very humanity that he was. That is, the human that he was, with all of the foibles and moles and warts that he had and things that impacted him psychologically and his view of other people. But you see, when the Jews did not convert, but actually opposed Muhammad, then he became increasingly embittered against them. As Muhammad acquired political and military strength, the persecuted prophet changed to a very ruthless politician. He began to have the Jews in Medina, this was his base of operations, either killed or dispossessed. In the year 627, now mind you, the Catholic Church had just been really formed in that time. It's really come into its own out of the apostasy that had been going on for the last 600 or more years. So in year 627, after an unsuccessful attack on Medina by the Arab army from Mecca, Muhammad rounded up hundreds of Jewish families in Medina. 700 Jewish men were put to the sword. Muhammad had their wives and children sold into slavery. Now he realized that in order to unify the divided and factious Arab tribes, some things don't change, there had to be an outward expansion. And it is interesting that the prophecy of the Bible concerning the descendants of Ishmael is that whose hand will be against every man. This is when he set his eyes toward, that is Muhammad did, toward Syria and what is present day Iraq, and they were his targets. It was then that he lifted all protection from, quote, pagans, unquote, Unless they submitted to Islam, they were put to the sword. Now the ninth chapter of the Quran comes from this period of Muhammad's life. It states that for four months, 
Pagan idolaters shall be left alone unmolested. Then comes the very chilling, cold-blooded command. From Surah 9, 5 and 11. When the sacred months are past, kill the idolaters wherever you find them. Arrest them, besiege them, and lie in ambush everywhere for them. But if they repent and take to prayer and render the alms levy, allow them to go their way. They are your brothers in the faith. Not only pagans, but even Jews and Christians, the once respected people of the book, now they come under Muhammad's ban. Unless they submitted, then they too were to be eliminated. Chapter 9 goes on to command Muslims, here's what it says, fight those from among the people of the book who do not embrace the true faith until they pay tribute out of their own hand and are utterly subdued. 9.29 This chapter goes on to rebuke in harshest of terms any Muslim who refuses to go forth to fight. God will punish him, he says, and replace him with others, 9, verses 38 and 39. Muslims who refuse to fight will be smitten by God either directly or ominously at the hands of faithful Muslims who do fight, 9 and verse 52. Wait if you will, the hesitant are told. We too are waiting. But those who go forth in God's holy war are promised either victory or martyrdom. 9 and verse 52. Those who die in God's cause are promised a paradise of sensual delights. Green gardens with flowing waters. Silk couches, abundant wine, of luxurious dark-eyed versions for their pleasure. And you can see the secular, sensual nature of their concept of what is involved in paradise. Now these are the last commands of the Quran with respect to unbelievers. Muhammad died shortly thereafter in 632. He died with plans before him for attacks on neighboring nations. His successors carried out those attacks. In 633, the armies of Islam took Persia, modern day Iran. In 635, Damascus, Syria fell. In 638, Jerusalem succumbed. In 640, Egypt was taken, and so on, right across North Africa to the Atlantic coast, even up into Spain. And they tried even the area we've known in more recent years, though it's broken up now in different countries as Yugoslavia. We in the West are democratic, and we have values that tolerate other religions. The freedoms of America are obvious. The Constitution makes that clear. And so do Western democracies in general. American officials have repeatedly said that we should not refer to the terrorists as Islamic fundamentalists because they are murderers. And no major religion advocates murder. I really do wonder if these officials have ever read the ninth chapter of the Quran. Either that, or they view the Quran, like many who claim to be Christians, view the Bible. They couldn't tell you much of what's in it. The truth of the matter is Islam is a, a religion. It's a religion which enjoins violence and which historically has been propagated by violence. Contrary to what you hear tirelessly, repeated in the media. The word Islam does not mean peace. That shows you how outright people get this plain lie. That claim is linguistically, to use a big term, false. Islam is the Arabic word for submission or surrender. That's what Muslims are called upon to do, to surrender everything to Allah. Thus, contrary to Western ways of thinking, Islam is not a church. It's crucial that we understand this. 
Islam is a total way of life. Everything is to be submitted to God. The government, the economy, social mores, every aspect of society is to be submitted to their concept of God. Islam is thus all-consuming. The Western idea of separation of church and state is meaningless in Islam and the teaching of the Quran. For everything is to be submitted to God. And what this means is that it's really the so-called, and I say so-called, moderate Arab states like Egypt and Turkey, where you have a secular government distinct from Islamic law. In effect, a separation of church and state, which are the ones who act inconsistently with Islam. And ISIS knows it. They've adopted a Western model of governance, a separation of church and state, which is incompatible, fundamentally incompatible with Islam. <clears throat> That's why the Islamic fundamentalists hate these modern Arab regimes and want to overthrow them. Fundam the fundamentalists understand more accurately the true nature of Islam than our own government does, and certainly the media, and most governments that are democratic. But... I guess we could say, of course, our public officials dare not say such a thing. We need the support of these moderate Arab states if our war against terrorism is succeed. Therefore, moderate Muslims must be courted and they must be reassured. And thus we get all these politically correct revisionist statements in the media that Islam means peace, that Muslims only fight in self-defense, not aggression, that Islam condemns violence, and so forth. All of this is politically motivated revisionism which betrays the true character of Islam as presented in the Quran. If you don't believe me, go read the book. See what they say about themselves. See what the prophet says. Just because a whole host of Arabs don't believe it or a bunch of them are secular doesn't change the book and what it teaches and those who do believe it and try to live up to it. Now this is not to say, let me make this clear, that Islam sanctions all of the atrocities perpetrated by groups like ISIS, or as it's been called, ISIL. I'm not aware of anything in the Quran or in Sharia law that would sanction the rape of women or the execution of children in the name of Allah. Nor am I saying that Muslims are, are violent people in general. What I am talking about is their theology and those that try to live consistent with it and apply it to every phase of their life. And that's what Mohammed called to be done. I don't know why we should be surprised that only a minority of Muslims really act the way they're acting in what is called terrorist. How many among those who are called Christians really live like the New Testament says they ought to live? So it shouldn't surprise us that you've got a big religion out here where only a minority of them are really trying to live like the book says. Does that sound familiar? We can be thankful that the vast majority of Muslims are not fundamentalists, but are nominal Muslims whose lives are far better than their theology. They may know very little about Islamic theology. In fact, asking a nominal Muslim what Islam teaching is rather like asking a nominal Catholic or Episcopalian or Methodist what the Bible teaches. He has no idea. He might recognize the Bible, but he doesn't. Oh, but that's being so blatant and hard-hearted. But go deal with it. Just try it out yourselves. And if nothing else, just go to YouTube and watch some of these interviews on the street. And they don't even know anything about America, much less the Bible. So you see how ignorance destroys us? Do you see how a false concept of God developed into the miserable religion that Islam is? And do you see what's happening in our nation and others because they don't want to recognize what a few who are causing all the trouble really believe? 
So I trust you can see how absurd is the claim that the God of Muhammad is the father of Jesus Christ. The father of Jesus Christ loves sinners and commands us to love even our enemies, not to mention our neighbor. The God of Muhammad loves only those who love him, and he's the enemy to unbelievers. His followers are commanded to hunt down and kill unbelievers unless until they submit. The God of the Quran is a defamation of the heavenly father proclaimed and revealed by the only begotten Son of the Father, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, our Lord and Savior, to whom we have bowed the knee and will continue to do so. In closing, we've seen first that the Christian concept of God as a trinity is rationally unobjectionable, and second, that the Muslim concept of God is, by contrast, Rationally objectionable because the God of Islam is morally deficient and therefore not the greatest conceivable being. And I like what one scholar said. Maybe we don't think of it enough. And I close with this. Thank God for God. You let that sink in for a while. Thank God for God who has revealed himself in the great book, the Bible, who loved us and sent his son to be a man and do what we couldn't do and go to the cross of Calvary, suffer, bleed, and die that we might have life and that I can stand here and preach his gospel and refute error and proclaim the truth that saves men's souls. If you're not a child of God, we beg of you to do the right kind of study, to study the Bible, to learn the truth. And then when you've learned it, as the Old Testament writer said, buy the truth and sell it not. Never let it be pride from your hands, but live always in harmony with it. To become a Christian, you must believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you've sinned, then we urge you to repent of those sins. Come confessing them, and we'll pray with you and for you. And the great God of love, who wants you to be saved, has evidenced in every way possible, will forgive you. And you can once again walk the straight and narrow way that leads to glory by the God of love who sent His Son to die for you. If you're subject to the great invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.